you via email. And with that, I would like to give a warm welcome to the room, to Dr. Levenstein and, uh, and take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, actually, I just thought of one thing. I'm just gonna, I'll be, I just wanna grab a piece of paper over here <laughs> because Anna was telling us about all of the technical complications and then there is also the human complications. <laughs> So thank you all so much. It is great I, to, to know that you are all out there and that you are all participating and I know enjoying um, this year's biennial meeting. I'm really happy to um, welcome you virtually to ICPSR um, and to give you an update on um, the state of your data consortium. So um, we are, as you may have heard, um, organizing for the next 60 years. We are starting the celebration, as I'll talk about more, of our first 60 years and planning for the next. Um, we are very pleased to let you know that the ICPSR membership is stable and is actually continuing to grow um, as it has for the last couple decades. We, have, um, we are doing more. Um, at ICPSR with lots of sponsored research that sponsored awards that are um, creating new archives and new activities and, and tools to improve how we make data available to you. As a result of this, we have been growing um, while we have been working remotely for the past year and a half up until the, about two weeks ago when we officially returned to the office as a hybrid organization. Um, we have been growing um, we've been learning a lot about how to work remotely and work in a hybrid organization um, over the last year and a half. But during that time, our staffing has actually increased by over 50 percent. So we have a lot of new people and people who've been working um, together virtually for a long time and doing that amazingly well. It's actually been it's we have learned new tools um, like Slack and like um, Kumo Space. Um, that we have been using to communicate as an organization and keep ourselves um, together as an organization. And we're happy to use those tools now um, in this biennial meeting. We're also working on a lot of infrastructure improvements to improve the data user experience from data deposit because we love those people who share their data um, and to discovery and access because we know that there's a lot of valuable data out there that you all are looking for, for your research, for your instruction, for your learning. Um, and we are really pleased to help make that um, available to you and to improve how we do that every day. I have to say, you will hear me say over and over again, many thank yous um, to many people, but especially um, to our ORs, to our DRs, the data community is uh, is the best, right? We are just, we are really lucky to work with such a great group of people. So as I said, the ICPSR membership is growing. It is growing, it was grew more slowly last year. We gained a net of five new members, but the ICPSR membership has grown every year um, for almost the last 20 years. Um, you, as you can see, it includes almost all of the um, R1 or extensive Carnegie classification student um, schools. It includes um, um, many of the BA schools and then many of the schools in other classifications as well. Um, a large proportion of our um, institutions are outside of North America. And, um, and then, of course, we have our Canadian institutions, and we have a special announcement about our Canadian institutions at the end. Um, we have, during the pandemic, um, been really benefited from having this strong and diverse consortium. It has allowed us to, to help support one another, to band together, to keep the consortium strong throughout. Um, we have supported 84 member institutions whose, whose own colleges or universities um, uh, were in financial straits. And we've provided member fee reductions, sometimes just not increasing that you know the annual fee would delaying that to sometimes there were a lot more um 
uh, much larger uh, reductions. It, there were actually five fully subsidized institutions where they we waived their fees for a year until their institutions were back on their feet financially so that they could continue to benefit from all of the data and broader resources that ICPSR makes available. Um, and um, in addition to helping our members themselves, we have been very committed during the, um, during the pandemic to use our resources, the data that we have to do good to support research on and response to the COVID-19 itself. As you may know, we established the COVID-19 data repository so that people who are collecting data related to COVID, particularly social, behavioral, and economic data related to COVID, could share that, could preserve it, and it could be reused to improve all of our knowledge. And the COVID-19 repository is there for that. Um, ICPSR was also recently awarded um, a coordinating center um, um, cooperative agreement with the national, by the National Institutes of Health um, to help support all of the research that they are funding on social, behavioral, and economic um, ramifications um, and implications of the pandemic. Um, and our job will be to help um, make the, the research community aware of, what, of that research and to help those researchers as they're doing this to manage their data, to share their data using the best practices and using the tools that ICPSR has been making available to all of you, um, as you know, for a long time. We also have, um, we wrote at the toward the very beginning of the pandemic, a paper on best practices for measuring the social, behavioral, and economic impact of epidemics. And that was a paper that was jointly had, was jointly worked on by a number of people at ICPSR, and has been downloaded um, from the, our website for over a thousand times. And this was just really important because there are lots of people who are trying to understand the behavioral and social implications of pandemics, and and they were. They, but they weren't coming from a background and ever having done this before, right? They could tell that this pandemic was influenced by social behavioral things, but they didn't, but they didn't have any experience with measuring them. And so letting people know, we do not have to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, we have to be able to respond quickly to crises like the pandemic, um, and we can do so by building on all of the scientific work that has come before us. Um, and we have, we'll have better science and faster science as a result. Um, so thanks to everyone um, at ICPSR who worked on that, um, especially um, Jim McNally and uh, Catherine Lavender. Uh, we have a number of other sponsored projects that are allowing us to um, build on what we what we do for our membership to do more for the broader research community. These include Research Data Gov, which is a portal which we um, have established under an agreement with the Office of Management and Budget of the United States and um, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. Um, this is a portal which was mandated by the Open Data Act, the evidence and the Act for um, Evidence-Based Policy, um, which required that the federal government make um, a single portal to ease um, make it easier for people outside the federal government and people inside the federal government to find the restricted data resources that the federal government makes available for research and evidence building, all of which were dispersed across different agencies and had very different processes for providing access. Research Data Gov is a one-stop shopping place for people to find out and apply for access to those research resources. I mentioned Open ICPSR's COVID um, repository earlier. Uh, another thing we've got up here um, are two, actually two new repositories that we have, one for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is fighting poverty around the world. They want to make sure, again, as they invest in fighting poverty and collecting data and doing analyses, that those analyses and that data are available to the research community, and they've chosen ICPSR to host the repository for them. The other is the Patient-Centered Outcome Research um, Institute, um, which is uh, which was um, 
uh, established, I believe, under the Affordable Care Act. Again, is funding lots and lots of research to improve the delivery of health care um, in the United States. And again, they want that research to be transparent and reproducible. They want those data that data that they are helping to support that that taxpayers in the country are so helping to support to be reused. And so the PCORI um, uh, data archive again is available. Um, to, to highlight that research and those data and share those with others so that we get the greatest scientific benefit from it possible. Uh, we, there are, I guess, six other projects that I'm going to just quickly mention to you. These are all brand new projects at ICPSR. There, there are too many new things that have been going on to tell you everything, but these are a few that I want to mention because they are things that we are just starting and are excited about. One is a new project that our aging archive is doing to use DDI lifecycle metadata. So this is an enhanced metadata format to help improve the, um, the discovery and analysis of longitudinal aging data, which they are doing with um, uh, support from the National Institute of Aging. We also have support from the National Science Foundation um, to improve recommender systems to, um, to, for people who are searching for data. So when you go and you search for data and you get this long list and you think, I don't know, is there, can we use recommender systems like we've all gotten used to in our shopping to improve how we find data? So the National Science Foundation is supporting research to do that. And finally, as we all know, a lot of research today doesn't just use one data set. It uses multiple data sets and improving the record linkage methodologies to make sure that there is um, that the, that that um, that that record linkage is done in a scientifically valid way um, uh, using appropriate inter inference on a population that we understand is is quite complicated. We have with support from the National Science Foundation established the linkage library um, to help build the community of people working on record linkage. And we have a new cooperative agreement with the Census Bureau to help them improve their record linkage methodology. So we're excited about those things, all of which help those sponsors, but also help the broader research community on these important challenges. I also want to mention three um, projects which have benefited from internal University of Michigan funding, for which we are very grateful, both from its Data Science Institute and its Anti-Racism Initiative. One is creating a new data resource, linking data from GI Bill after World War II and mortgage guarantee records, also in the post-World War II era, to look at the impact of racial discrimination on um, on home ownership and on um, veterans after um, World War II. A second is part of the College and Beyond II project, which is, in, which is creating another data resource to help him, uh, study the impact of, um, uh, of, of the college experience, and in particular, the liberal arts college experience using a combination of survey and administrative data. We've been building College and Beyond um, two with support, which, for which we are very grateful um, from the Mellon Foundation. This is a new small award to develop a machine, machine learning analysis approach to studying student transcripts. Studying, obviously, student transcripts are complicated, messy things. And when you have millions of them, making sense of that data in a meaningful way is, is complicated and we're excited about that project. Finally, as you know, we have been working on improving um, how um, researchers share their social media data. Um, and, we, and, and we have a research project which is focusing on how we make social media archival data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, something which we try to do with all of our data at ICPSR um, and which we encourage the research community to embrace um, as an ideal for um, research data. Um, and which, uh, and but which is particularly challenging for social media data. So we're excited about that project. I wanted to highlight a couple great things that have been going on at ICPSR. Um, the, the ICPSR bibliography just celebrated its 20th anniversary. I hope you all got to participate in that 20th anniversary celebration. We now have 98,506 data-related publications, publications which are linked to the ICPSR data set that they have used in their analyses. That means we are getting close to 
100,000. So look out for more celebrations. We believe in celebrating um, the great work that our, the folks in bibliography are doing. I also wanted to point out that in addition to um, uh, finding these publications and associating them with their data sets, our bibliography folks have been involved in looking at two other new projects. One they call current events in the bid, and that highlights particular research articles. It tells you and, and anybody in your community that you care to share it with um, about new research using a particular ICPSR data set. Um, and that's a great shout out for the authors of those research as well. We know our, um, our authors and our data depositors appreciate that. And then research spotlights, it actually takes a whole look at a literature, it's like a little literature review about a particular topic using data. So to, which I can't actually imagine a more useful thing when you're trying to teach a class and you're talking about a topic and you say, yes, go out there and see what you can do. What is the research out there and what's the data behind it? Those research spotlights are there for you to learn about new topics, to help your students learn about new topics and the data that are behind them. So hats off to the ICPSR bibliography, both on its growth and its new activities that are so important. I also want to mention that ICPSR is doing a podcast. Hopefully all of you know about Data Brunch, um, the ICPSR podcast. Episodes drop. I had to like, talk to my children to learn how to say things like episodes drop. But anyway, uh, we release. No, okay. Episodes drop is so much cooler. Episodes drop every other Sunday. Find it on wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, in addition to Data Brunch, there are actually a number of our other projects are also doing podcasts. I know our Aging Archive has a regular podcast. Um, Peers, the Education um, uh, Data um, Hub for Education Research, um, is also doing podcasts I've done, um, on people who are doing research um, on STEM education and the data that they use. So take a so check out our podcasts. To update you on our holdings, as you can imagine, our holdings continue to grow with all of this activity. We now have 82,520 data sets. 71,000 of these are on demand. And about 10% right, about of them are, but more than that now, 15%, are restricted data sets. These are restricted usually to protect the confidentiality of the participants um, in the study. And, um, and we make it as easy to make these data accessible to you as is um, in a way that is safe and consistent with the commitments um, promised to the people um, who participate in the study. We also have 5,500 um, uh, data sets in our um, self-publishing um, repository. As I mentioned, we have 98,000. I think I have a different number because these were done on different days and, uh, and it grows every time, every day. Data-related publications, over 5.7 million variables in the social sciences variables database. Last year, 902 data sets were downloaded and 32,000 different people used their MyData accounts to access ICPSR. The website was visited over 300,000 times. Our mem the membership part of our website was um, visited over 300,000 times. So we know that there are lots of people out there using this resource we, um, and we, we, we love hearing from them and we're glad to, to have you visit us virtually and in person as soon as that's safe. Um, just to give you an idea, our, as you can see, um, the number of awards that we have continues to grow. The value of those awards continue to grow. Those awards are both for building new data tools to analyze data, like the portal for applying for access to restricted data. They're also for creating new data repositories like the PCORI and um, Millennium uh, um, Corporation archives. They're also for creating new data resources like College and Beyond 2 and like um, the Decennial Census Linkage Project, which is actually a good chunk of that money at the end, which is creating a resource for people to be able to study um, the, the United States from the second half of the 
20th century to now um, by longitudinally linking the decennial census records. Our ICPSR summer program is doing, has been doing a fabulous job the last two years. It continues to grow and serve more people. This past year in 2021, as was the case in 2020, our summer program was fully virtual. Um, we are the summer program staff and all of its instructors and teaching assistants worked incredibly hard to create an exciting experience to bring people together to learn about statistics and data. Um, we had more participants this summer than ever before. 1,169 people um, participated in the program. We had 32 four-week workshops, 42 short workshops, and 12 Blaylock lectures. Those are our evening lectures, though I guess some of them were at lunchtime this year, depending on the time zone and the, the schedule of the, uh, the, the lecturer. Um, we gave out over 80 scholarships for people to participate. Um, and even with um, the, the pivot to online um, and the, and the su substantial um, increase in scholarships that we made this past year, we actually ran a large budget surplus and that surplus will be reinvested in scholarships for 2022. We do hope in 2022 to be able to have an in-person program as well as continue to make available many of our uh, great classes online. As a result of all of the work that our membership team does, as a result of the, the commitments that all of our members have made to us and continue to, to stay with us during these difficult times, as a result of the sponsored funding that we get um, and, of the, and of the financial strength of the summer program, ICPSR is in a strong financial position. And we know that this allows us to do more for you just to give you an idea of what um, our finances look like, our, um, the, our operating revenues um, for non-sponsored, so things that are not paid for by direct um, sponsored uh, funding, um, uh, so the things that are kind of for the membership was the operating revenues were about $12 million. Um, about 38% of that actually comes from sponsors as indirect funds, about 36% from membership fees, and about 20% from the summer program. The other 6% comes from a variety of other sources, many of which are from the University of Michigan itself. And we're particularly grateful um, for the support of our, of our host institution um, in that way. Um, as a result of this strong and diverse funding that we have, we actually ended the year with a, um, a fund, an increase in our fund balance of um, over $800,000. Um, we expect next year that our operating revenues will grow. We expect that our expenses will grow even more. We continue to do more and hire more people. Um, so right now we're projecting that, um, that we will run um, a, uh, in the red a little bit, about $300,000 next year. We're not, I have to say, worried about that. We think that it is, if we if we run a $300,000 deficit next year, it will be well worth it for the kinds of things that we're investing in. But we also know that as in most years, um, we're, we actually end up bringing in sponsored funding that we don't know about um, at this point in the year. So we, um, we hope to do, uh, we hope to have it something better by the end of the year in any case. But we're not, we're not, our, our reserves are, are um, can easily handle a deficit of that size because of your long support. Um, as, we met, as I mentioned, we are, we are now seeing unprecedented growth in ICPSR staff. Um, so uh, five years ago, we were at about 100 people. We're now, we have now over 150 people on the, in the ICPSR staff and faculty. Um, much of that growth comes from people who work um, in curation, who are doing all of the work to improve um, the data that, that we make available to you. And as we get more data, we need more curators and they do a fabulous job. We have over 40 people now in our curation staff. 
Um, uh, they do a fabulous job making that data available to you. Our project management staff, they also do our user support. And I think one of the things that ICP people love about ICPSR isn't just that our website is great and our data is great when you download it, but that we have people, human beings, who if you write or call us will actually respond to you and answer questions about the data. So our project management and user support group is really important. We've also been growing our IT staff quite a bit to build new <laughs> software that is more user focused. Um, we have a we have a new team of a half a dozen people whose experience is in both IT and art. So they are our UX team. Uh, and I, I, I am neither an IT person or an especially not an art person. And it is really, really amazing to see um, as you could as you've long seen from that, the kind of graphics that we give in, that we produce in ICPSR that um, paying attention to visual representation and non-visual representation of data is, um, is incredibly important. And so we're really excited to have our team growing in a way that will improve the user experience as people interact with our website, our tools, and our data. Like most of the world over the last year and a half, we have been going through transitions. We were fully on site in the beginning of March. Uh, 2020, and then we were fully working from home for, um, oh, about 15 months. And in the summertime, basically in the beginning of July, a few of us started going back into the Perry building, our home. Um, the building is now fully open, um, and we have really embraced a hybrid um, work environment. Um, any day, about half of our staff um, is in the office. About a quarter of our staff is working fully remote because they live um, at a distance or because um, they have needs that, um, that really require them to have more uh, physical distance from other people. So we continue to use and improve our um, virtual tools for, uh, for communicating among ourselves as well as with you. Um, so we have we have been on site and we have been remote and we are we are really now um, excited to be um, working in this new hybrid environment, um, despite what you know what is there questionably unquestionably um, some challenges and we are learning as we go. Um, so and and of course the great thing is as we learn we also share that that gets incorporated into everything we do for all of you. ICPSR is strongly committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. We continue to work, whether we're in person or remote, on these issues every single day. We think about them in terms of how we work together. We think about them in terms of how we serve our membership. We think about them in terms of the kinds of data that we make available. Um, we, uh, the ICPSR staff and the faculty are involved in diversity and equity and inclusion leadership positions across the Institute for Social Research and the University of Michigan. There's an ICPSR DEI statement that was approved by council at the council meeting back in April. And um, if you haven't seen that, I urge you to take a look at it. This is a, a strong commitment that was actually drafted by a staff, originally drafted by a staff group at ICPSR who felt like it was really important for us to articulate and share with our members um, our, um, our principles regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's there. One of the ways that we um, that we implement those principles in our lives is in our through our hiring practices. And we have really worked hard to improve both the outreach that we do um, to make sure that we are getting a diverse and inclusive um, uh, applicants and we are hiring a diverse and, uh, group of people to come and work at ICPSR and that we are making sure that we don't let implicit biases get into in the way that uh, and, and interfere in our making the best possible hiring decisions. And so we've been doing things like anonymizing all of our um, our, our resumes when we uh, when we engage in employment. We are continuing to hire. If you have students, if you have you know if you have friends, if uh, we are a great place to work, we are. Somebody was telling me they, um, oh, oh our, uh, that we had um, uh, we we have especially when you have IT people. There are other organizations that try to steal them that might not be as. Um, as mission driven or as family friendly as ICPSR is. And so we've been really pleased to hear that we have managed to retain some really great staff because of those values. So 
help us recruit. Tell people that we're on, that ICPSR is a great place to come and work. Um, as I mentioned, we also um, uh, live out our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion through the way that we collect and share data. Um, and uh, the Resource Center for Minority Data, which is something which the membership established probably 15, I don't, 15 years ago, um, continues to um, identify and make available to the research community valuable data resources for analyzing underrepresented groups, um, groups that are often invisible in, um, in data sets that, um, and in reaching out to underrepresented populations to make sure that they have access to data. Um, one really um, important study that was released this year was the TransPOP study, which is the first nationally representative um, study of the trans population. Um, I didn't put it on the slide, but I, I also know we had a great webinar this, sum, this summer that was about um, using data sets um, that study the Native American population, and other indigenous populations, what those data sets are and how to use those responsibly and ethically with respect for the communities that are represented in those studies. So um, it's, it's uh, uh, we, have, we have people who are specifically um, uh, charged with uh, focusing on diversity and, uh, in, in, our, uh, in our organization, but we also have, that's a commitment that everyone in the organization makes, I mean, how we do our jobs every day. Um, ICPSR is also has a very large, long commitment to accessibility. Um, our, our website is accessible, our, our webinars are accessible, all of our resources, we really make an effort to make them accessible. One, that we have been evangelizing this um, within I, um, the Institute for Social Research and the University of Michigan more generally. And I have to say that that evangelism, I say, I think really paid off um, as um, the Institute for Social Research uh, um, committed itself to improving um, its accessibility for the Institute as a whole. And ICPSR staff people now um, both drafted our technology, technological accessibility statement and lead the technological accessibility team um, at ISR, and I'm really proud of them for that. We are on a continuous quest to improve the infrastructure that we make available to you and the research community so that um, we have th that a broader group, an inclusive group of people has access to the tools and high quality data necessary to do cut, cutting edge social science research. We have been reinventing our data systems from ingest, that means deposit, right? When you let somebody shares data with us, we wanna make that easy. We wanna um, make our curation processes um, uh, useful and valuable to you, um, and we want to make them efficient so that people aren't waiting for months and sometimes even longer than months to get their data out. We've done a great job at bringing down the length of time it takes for data um, to be published when it gets deposited at ICPSR, and we continue to work on that. We also know that people come to ICPSR because our data, because of the way we disseminate data, we describe the data that people can use it. They can download it in the format that they need. All of these things make data easier for people and we continue to work on improving those. We wanna benefit our members with efficient data deposits, discovery of data, more types of data um, than ever before. So our priorities for, um, when I say types of data, obviously people have been coming to um, ICPSR for 60 years for survey data, but increasingly even our survey data has all kinds of things that are that are that are different. That have geos, we have shape files that people give us as part of their studies, or they have. Um, Oh, we have a, I didn't even mention, I don't know, how did I not mention our EEG data? Um, we had a whole project talking about best practices in archiving and sharing um, um, data, data on brain waves. Um, and don't ask me to talk any more about it than that, but there's a white paper. If you have researchers who are coming to you because they're working with EEG data and they don't know what to do, or your work with EEG data, look for the ICPSR white paper with guidance for that. Um, so those are the kinds of challenges that we know that our researchers are facing and we wanna be able to serve you and your data needs. Priorities, 
for us are improving confidential data access. We talked about how we're doing this in collaboration with the federal statistical agencies. We are also doing this for our data sets. We want to provide you with more different, more useful and different ways to get access to data and to do that in an efficient process. We want better um, tools for facilitate sharing your data, analysis of your data, and management of multiple types. And as I said, we are on a constant quest. Quests seem to make it on this slide twice. I don't know how many of you remember um, Shrek, but Shrek was on a quest. Anyway, we are on a quest to improve the user experience and accessibility. I'm sorry, it's just free association, but in my family, we know the entire Shrek movie by heart. Um, so. <laughs> So right now, sometimes it can be challenging to work with data. And this is kind of the current experience of working with data is perhaps climbing a hill as you try to find the right software and the right data and there are potholes. And over here we have this, I don't know if I have a pointer here. I don't know if you can see this. This is the restricted data cave where you go and get locked for a long, long time. And maybe you have a hard time finding your way to get access to that restricted data. Or maybe you go up and you use data in the cloud and then before you know it, you have a million dollar bill and you don't know how that, that happened. And then finally you come down here and you think, oh my gosh, I'm done. I never want to look at that data. And it goes into a graveyard and is not available. Your research is not reproducible and transparent. You're right. Nobody can ever look or build on what you've done because the research is dead. Or maybe you find the energy to go and share it and you put it I don't know, on your website or someplace where it's there and somebody might be able to find it if they stumble on it in this attic. And if your attic looks like the attic in this, in this house, you can see sometimes it is very hard to find data. At ICPSR, we have been committed for 60 years to improving every aspect of that data experience, right? So the data is not going into a graveyard or lost in the attic and that people are not unhappy and miserable wandering in the, you know, wandering in their quest to find restricted data in a cave. And so we are, we are building what we like to think of as a, uh, a super highway um, that, that, is, uh, that, that brings you not to, not to a graveyard I don't know, that looks like the Care Bears to me. So, you know, you can just tell when I was raising children, I'm talking about Care Bears and Shrek. But anyway, um, uh, this is a super highway to, to provide people with an efficient um, uh, experience in working with data. And we are, we are looking forward to offering things like an enhanced researcher passport for access to restricted data, um, linkage library that I mentioned earlier, um, a resource for um, sharing um, link, record linkage strategies and um, our social media archive. All of these things are the kinds of experiences that we want you to be able to have as you're working with different types of data so that you can collect your data, access it, analyze it, and share it with others in a, um, in a scientifically responsible manner, an ethically responsible manner. Um, we are only able to do this because of all of you. So this is where Data Jeff and I say thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you, um, to all of our members, to our data users, to those who advocate for data, uh, data access and data support. Um, it is so incredibly important to making it possible for us to do our work and, for, and to making us, and also for, um, letting us see the importance of our the in the impact of our work um, i want to thank you for attending our biennial meeting um, i know that all of you have been enjoying the presentations um, and the, the the social interaction in the kumo space there are over 400 registrants for the um for the workshop there are over 180 first time um, attendees in the workshop over 200 member institutions are represented um, uh, who are attending the biennial workshop from 16 countries. So um, this is, um, while we are very sad that you're not all here in Ann Arbor, we are really glad that we can bring together this number of people in a virtual space to interact and learn from one another about data resources and data tools. I want to thank as well our current and outgoing council members. 
Um, the outgoing council members are the people listed at the top of this, and they include Bob Ray Bordelon, the, um, the social behavioral science librarian at Princeton University, um, who is not only a council member, but a longtime um, OR and a previous Flanagan Award winner. Lisa Cook, um, who has been the council chair for the last two years from Michigan State University, which shows how even though we, we uh, we are very proud of and pleased to be at our, our, our host institution, the University of Michigan. We are also inclusive, um, and we have been pleased and proud to have Michigan State um, faculty as our chair. Um, Lindsay Malcolm PQ of the California Institute of Technology and Esther Wilder of Lehman College um, and the City University of New York. And so we really thank very, very much to all of them for their commitments over the last four years and longer um, to ICPSR. I um, also want to thank our continuing members, Dave Armstrong of Western University, John Cawthorn from Wayne State, James Duaron of the University of Alberta, Kristen Eschenfelder of the University of Wisconsin, Mark Hansen from Columbia, Trevon Logan, Ohio State, did I say, are we inclusive or what? Um, Ken Smith, um, University of Utah and Catherine Wallman um, of the um, U.S. Office of Management and Budget. Um, oh, was there? Okay. Um, I also want to thank all of the ORs and the nominating committee um, for putting together the slate for the new membership um, on our council so that some people will be staying and some people will be rotating off. But, um, and we have a new council chair. Um, Dave Armstrong is the nominee um, of the council chair. Dave Armstrong is a political scientist at Western University and a longtime instructor in the summer program in quantitative methods of social research. So we're really pleased to have him um, um, and grateful to him um, for stepping into the role as, um, as our, the next ICPSR council chair. Um, the incoming members of the uh, council include two um, incumbent members, John Cawthorn, who has been chair of our, um, who actually I should say um, is a professor of uh, information, dean of, um, their, of the, way, the Wayne State University School of Information and dean of their library. Um, and he has also been the chair of our finance and budget committee, and we are incredibly grateful to him for that role. Um, and then Catherine Wallman, who is the retired, retired chief statistician of the United States, and she has again agreed to um, stay on, and we're really grateful to them for that. The new members of uh, the new member nominees of the council are Randall Aki from the University of California at Los Angeles, Los UCLA, Mike Caffarella of MIT, Susan Fraser Kwasi, who's from Prairie View A and M, um, and she is also an OR, and Gisela Sin from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, so thanks to all of you. Um, uh, for uh, your nominations, we will be sent. You will certainly, you will soonly, soonly, soon. You will soon, <laughs> you will soon receive um, a ballot for uh, your approval um, with these nominees. So all of the ORs will get that late next week. Shortly, that was the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> um, as I continue my thanks, I now want to turn to some congratulations. The first I want to mention is actually one that is not here. We also gave the ICPSR Innovator of the Year Award, um, was awarded yesterday, to those of you who didn't see it, um, to um, the, uh, the 2020 ICPSR Summer Program for their pivot you know, between, you know, the middle of March and, you know, I don't know, in May or June, when we have our first short courses, they took a program that had been for 57 or 56 years every year in person, and they turned it into a fully online program. And it was an amazing effort. Um, and we are really grateful to them. Um, so congratulations to the whole summer program team on that Innovator of the Year Award. We also awarded two very special pro uh, awards to two very special people. Um, the Warren Miller Award, Warren Miller was of course the ICPSR founder in 1962, and the Warren Miller Award for a meritorious service to the social sciences went to Ron Jarman, who is the current acting um, director of the U.S. Census Bureau, and Ron is, um, I have to say, Ron is someone I have had the pleasure of working with 
um, for a long time because of his leadership of the federal statistical research data centers working to make restricted data available um, to um, the research community. Um, he has, in his own research, helped to create and incredibly valuable new um, data resources, including a longitudinal business database and other economic data. And he led the effort that I have to say, um, save the 2020 decennial census. And the decennial census is a keystone of our democracy. And we are incredibly grateful to Ron and to the entire Census Bureau um, uh, staff and, um, for the work that they did to make that a success. Um, the one of the really cool things about the Constitution, right, is the calling for that we that our our country is organized around um, accurate um, and high quality data collection. That's how we make our democracy work. And they and even during a pandemic with enormous challenges, they um, they um, they pulled that off. And I am I am, I am so impressed and grateful to them. So. Thank somebody from the Federal Statistical Service <laughs> today. Um, I also want to thank Jane Fry. Jane Fry, and congratulate Jane Fry. Jane is um, a former council member and uh, an OR, and, and she is the 2021 recipient of the William Flanagan Award for Distinguished Service as an ICPSR organization official representative. Um, Jane is also one of our instructors um, in a, in the summer program course for ORs. Um, Jane was on the council when I became director of ICPSR, and I have to tell you, she is one of those people who um, is, is warm and caring and tells you the things you need to hear. Um, and, and not everybody can do that in a way that is effective, and I learned from her, and I'm really, really appreciative um, of um, of her commitment to ICPSR and of her commitment to um, data access more generally, the work that she has done. Um, actually, she, as I, I said something about Canada, she is one of the great things. Oh, and I, I actually just glided right by the other. One of the great things that um, our Canadian members are doing um, is uh, Jane has been a leader in uh, Canadian data access um, for, um, for her entire career. So we are pleased to give um, the Flanagan Award to a representative from a Canadian member. And as you might have noticed, though I didn't highlight at the time, and I believe this we, we our our incoming council chair is also from a Canadian university. And I believe that this is the first time, though I didn't confirm that, that we have had a chair from a Canadian university. So the Canadians are, are well represented and now we just have to get the border fully open so they can be here. ICPSR is turning 60, right? Um, we are looking back at what does this mean? We were founded in 1962 as the ICPR, the S for social was added in 1975. We were originally 22 member institutions who banded together to support the collection and dissemination of the American National Election Study, which continues to be produced and disseminated to the research community um, uh, um, to this day. And you can find it um, uh, at ICPSR. Uh, of course, that was, it was done a little differently back then. It was on magnetic tape. The first version of this, I have to say, said real to real tape. And I thought this that was written by somebody who was not born when um, this was done because real to real tapes are different from, from computer tapes. The life expectancy in 1962 was 70.1 years. I went and looked about, well, what is it now? And of course, if you go and look, you will, it will, it is one of those moments that will break your heart because. Um, life expectancy this year was 77 years, a year less than it was a year ago before the pandemic. Um, so we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, we need to go up again. The U.S. population was 186 um, million. It is now almost twice that. And John F. Kennedy was president of the United States. Um, the Jetsons um, were founded that same year. Goldfish crackers, lemon heads, Barbie Dreamhouse. Kmart and Walmart were founded in that year. So 1962 um, is when, and, and, and ICPSR. Um, in 2001 was, the, was when we um, first started disseminating data um, through the web. So until then, 
those all you ORs out there, what we were doing was sending you those tapes and you were sharing those with your, uh, uh, with your researchers and with your students. Um, and so we thank all those ORs who did, uh, uh, who did all of that legwork. We're, we're pleased that we're able to uh, focus our work and work time on things besides just delivering um, uh, reels of tape. We are also, of course, as we said, looking forward. We live in a world in which data is ubiquitous. We create and we use data all the time on our phones, in the store. Um, uh, it's, it's constant, right? And that means that we need to improve data literacy. We need to improve not just how professors use data, but how everyone uses data and everyone understands data because data has to be the basis for decision making, both for our individual lives, if you're deciding where to go to college, when you're making policies, when you're running a business, when you're running an organization. Data has never been more important than at this moment in history. At ICPSR, we are committed to making data accessible and useful um, and, and safe. We're committed to transparency because transparency is at the heart of the scientific process. People will trust science if they can see what's behind it. If it's not just something that's presented to them as magical from somebody else, but it's something which is accessible and understandable and that they can participate in. We can do that by making data accessible. We also need to protect the confidentiality of people who are being studied. We all know that data is being collected about us all the time and we don't quite know what's going on with it. And we want to know that the people who are being studied, that they are, are treated with respect and that their privacy is protected. And we are committed to using lots of different technologies, lots of different approaches to, um, at ICPSR to, to improve the way that we protect confidentiality. Um, and, the, and to help the rest of the research community and the broader world protect the confidentiality of the people that we study. We're committed to preservation because you know what? Creating data is expensive. We spend billions of dollars every year on research data and we shouldn't waste it by throwing data away. And we're committed to access because data shouldn't just be for people who are um, in, you know, in institutions that are incredibly well resourced and can, you know, buy a few professors um, exactly what they need. We want access for the broader community for people so that, so that people understand and can use the information about the world in which they live. We are committed to building a legacy for future data users. We have a great legacy of which we are incredibly proud and we are looking forward to working with all of you to continue that legacy in the future. We are also looking forward in the next year to celebrating with you because we like to party uh, and we intend to do that over the next year. So you will be hearing from us more um, about the celebrations of our 60th birthday um, in the coming weeks and months. And now, Dana, Jeff, and I are happy to take your questions. Anna, are you there to, uh, to is somebody there to tell me if there are questions? Right now, we don't have questions. Right now, we don't have questions. I answered everything. I'm going to. Although we did have one comment that um, um, some an individual loves Shrek and thinks that we need to utilize the term uh, data donkey somehow in our uh, upcoming uh, years. Here. All right, I think we can do that. I think I, I, I love Shrek. I'm sorry, I love Shrek. <laughs> not, not more than data Jeff, but I do love Shrek. Actually, when we gave out our, our awards at our, our ceremony yesterday, I have to say our awardees, um, they were sort of looking at their plaques and wondering how come their plaques that were classy and engraved didn't have Data Jeff on them. And I'm like, okay, we gotta, we gotta up our game. Data Jeff has to be on our plaques. So. Right. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, interested in your response, um, both as a staff member and um, advocate for ICPSR, but how did COVID change ICPSR for better or worse? 
So how did COVID change ICPSR for better or for worse? Um, so I, I will start out by saying um, people at I mean, so the, the bottom line is, I mean, it, so there are lots and lots of things that have happened both for better and for worse. People at ICPSR have gotten sick and struggled through COVID. They have had family members who got sick, sick and struggled through COVID. We have lost family members and friends um, because of COVID. So um, there are things that we have learned and that we're doing better now because of what we learned over the last um, year. But I think it is, I, I don't wanna even start to talk about any of that without saying that there has been an enormous human toll um, and on all of us, even those of us who have not gotten sick or not lost, um, I don't think there's anybody who hasn't lost someone at this point. Um, um, but um, uh, anyway, but so I, I you know, 700,000 Americans have died. Um, and I think that that's something that we don't ever want to lose sight of, um, that there's been a toll on all of us on on the on our level of stress and the way that we interact. That's and and ICPSR is is not exempt from that at all. Um, on the other hand, I think that ICPSR has done a fabulous job in the midst of that, in caring for one another, in protecting one another, um, in trying to um, even when we were physically distant of um, being supportive of one another in the ways that we could. Um, we have also learned new ways. Um, to make sure that we do connect with one another, like new virtual tools. We had never used Kumo space before, and that's really fun. You know, I, you know, if it, if you, you know, I can have a glass of wine on a computer screen. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we've also learned how to be. Um, I mean, our we had 1,100 people in a webinar that we did um, a week or so ago. Um, we had more people than ever were able to participate in the summer program, people from around the world who would never have been able to afford or take the time off uh, um, from what they from or the, from their work or their home responsibilities to come to Ann Arbor for an extended period of time. So all of those do living virtually has um, has allowed us to be more inclusive in some ways, and that's really important. Um, I think that there are other ways in which it has been hard. Um, uh, for our work because we're we're more isolated and there and um and even though we do lots of things we also are uh, having to be much more intentional which can be a good thing um, but much more intentional about how we communicate with uh, each other and especially as we've been growing and having new people join the organization make sure they understand the full breadth of what we do and that can be and that can be really challenging one of the things when i first came to icpsr was that people were really concerned about silos and different people in the organization not knowing about what went on in the rest of the organization, not getting to know people, not uh, and um, and we really worked hard to create um, communication paths that let people meet the people in the rest of the organization and learn about them and and interact and take on new responsibilities and grow in their jobs and what they do for the community um, and for the consortium. Um, and and that is and that's harder um, though we have we have again with intentionality and great tools that we are so lucky to have access to um, we have we have been doing that um, other yeah those are anyway um, there are probably other th things but um, those are the things that come to mind um, how about here is uh, what is uh, one thing about which you are most excited. Uh, in the next year for ICPSR? Um, one thing. So, um, I'm excited about so many things. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, Well, I'm excited about um, the new work that we are all doing and we're working on across the organization to build a new platform for uh, that will help us to improve all of the tools that we have. Um, ICPSR, because we are because we have 60 years of experience, we have a lot of great tools and a lot of great things that we've done. But um, but we have to be we are constantly trying to kind of reinvent. Um, ourselves and the tools that we have in order to 
um, in order to uh, um, allow us to do more things in a more flexible way. And the growth in our IT team has allowed us to develop um, new tools that I and new interoperability. We talk about data interoperability, um, but I think I'm really excited about having better interoperability among the tools that we use ourselves and that we make available to others. So we're really excited about that. Um, I have to say, in my own little kind of daily geeky way, I've been working on record linkage for a long time. So I'm really excited about. Um, this project with the Census Bureau, which is just getting started, but which I think will allow us to um, learn about what all of us have been learning about, about record linkage across ICPSR and across um, and across multiple institutions. Um, we've been, we do this, we do record linkage um, in a number of projects. We have a great project um, working with um, um, Dr. Mona, Hannah, Atisha, and Flint on the Flint Registry, um, linking data from the Flint Registry to administrative data. And one of our great new um, members of our IT team, um, Matt Nizol, I can give a shout out to Matt, did a survey, a review of the existing software for record linkage that helped them to select a better data product and save a lot of money um, for the Flint registry. Um, and that's just, and, and he's, and Matt isn't somebody I ever even thought of as someone who was working on record linkage. Um, our decennial record linkage project is doing this. Our college and beyond record linkage project is doing this. Linkage library is bringing together people who are working on record linkage. And, and I think this is important in part because, um, uh, as some people have heard me say, people do a lot of record linkage without thinking about it in ways that gives um, uh, can give can create very unrepresentative data sets and they don't analyze. Um, and if you use sort of a black box approach to record linkage, you can create a data set that you think represents a population and actually because people, some people don't link as well as others um, to other th things in other administrative data or other um, because women change their names or some people and some ethnic groups um, names are much more common than others and it means that you end up with a very under uh, unrepresentative um, a data set and I think understanding and improving our practices in that way is something which will be useful for the data products that we have here at ICPSR but also useful for the research community which is increasingly engaging in this these really powerful um, uh, uh, techniques that can improve um, and give us richer data sets, but can also mislead us if we don't understand um, who's missing from those data. So as people at ICPSR know, if you ask me for one thing, you're not going to get one thing, but there's two things. I, I restrained myself. All right, and then uh, perhaps final question as we kind of wrap things up is, what do you look forward to in terms of working with the new ISR director in the coming years? Oh, well, um, so I didn't mention um, in today's presentation our new ISR director. I, our new ISR director is Kate Cagney. Um, Kate is um, uh, is a sociologist and public health um, uh, researcher who comes to us from the University of Chicago and, um, and NORC. Um, she's somebody we've worked with um, at the um, at ICPSR and ISR for a long time because she has worked on creating valuable data resources for the study of aging, which we disseminated ICPSR. Um, I was really pleased to um, serve on the ISR um, director search committee, and I have to say I'm thrilled to have um, Kate uh, leading the organization now. Um, she is. Um, she is smart, she is caring, she understands um, data, she understands social science research, she understands why social science research matters to academics and to the broader, um, the broader world, why it matters to policymakers. Um, I think she'll be a great advocate for social science and I think she'll be a great advocate for all of the people who use the social science data that we create and disseminate. And I think she'll be a great advocate for all the people who work um, at ISR and ICPSR. And, and I have seen that um, just in the last, um, I think three weeks. Um, 
no, I guess she started September 1st. So she's been here a whole month. Um, but she, um, she, uh, she came to us, came and joined us for our banquet last night to celebrate with our award winners. Um, she is, uh, um, she came and met with the whole staff at our first all staff meeting of the year. She's, uh, I, I think she, she's, she's going to be great. Um, so uh, there are many, many things I'm excited to work with her on. Um, and I think we'll, uh, we'll be really, we're, we're really, really lucky to have a leader like her. All right. Well, I think we are um, we're at time. So um, thank you very much, Maggie. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in 2023. Yes. And hybrid. We'll be hybrid. Yes. We, 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 yes, we have learned the benefits yes, of, of hybrid and we are we are taking advantage of them and we will continue to use them um, to talk to all of you that we do hope to see you in Ann Arbor again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, there is one more thing. Uh -oh. I would be remiss if I did not thank one very, very important group. And that is the group that organized our biennial meetings. So first of all, an enormous shout out to Anna Shelton, who started off this meeting and many of the sessions. She is a fabulous leader. The group also includes Shelly Petrinko, Linda Detterman, Lisa Kelly, Jenna Tyson, Dory Knight Ingram, Stephanie Carpenter, Karani Renault, Becky, Chu, Lynette Holter, Scott Campbell, Esther Pavlogi Poliak, Sarah Burchart, and Rachel Huang. Thank you so much to all of them for organizing this fabulous meeting. Okay. Yeah. Anna has power. And see you at two all right. Thank you all so much for everyone who's joining us virtually. It was a total delight to have the, uh, let me just go ahead and mute our room. Um, I, I can do that now. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, perfect. Well, it was wonderful to have you all. Um, I'm going to remove the pin so that you can actually see me. Um, Yes, agreed with all of the things that are coming in into chat. Um, unfortunately, you can't see them, but we are getting your messages. Um, I've seen a couple of messages that I will be responding to. Um, so thank you. If your question didn't get answered, we will be following up. Um, and then with that, we will be uh, resuming again at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Let me go ahead and just put this into the chat. Here you are. Here is our registration for the uh, for the next meeting, our um, representatives uh, boot camp with our three data amigos, Ron, Jane, and Bobre. And with that, we will see you all at 2 p.m. Thanks so much for being here.